it's just amazing to see what God is doing. It, it, it's been crazy. But I think a lot of times when you're in it, right, how many of you know that when you're in the midst of it, like God may be moving in your life, but when you're in the middle of it, it's hard to see, right? In fact, like my favorite scripture to prophesy over people, if, you've, if I've prayed over you more than once, I've probably prayed this scripture over you because I just think it's so relevant to each and every person. It comes from Isaiah 43 and it says this, it says, behold, I am doing something new. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. I'm doing a new thing. It's, behold, now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and I will make springs in the desert. Now, now, the key to that to me is, do you not perceive it? See, in the midst of what we're going through, in the midst of when we're in it, it's really hard to perceive when God is doing something new. It's really hard to see sometimes that God is making a way in the wilderness. It's really hard to see that he is making springs in the desert when you're in the middle of the desert, right? So maybe some of you have been in a wilderness, you've been in a desert, and you're looking for the way. It's hard to perceive it in the middle. God says, I'm doing something new. Do you not see it? And so I want to start a series today because, you know, I wanted to celebrate everything that God was doing. We put a lot, we put a lot into today, but sadly, you know, I, I told you guys there'd be new merch today. Uh, there was apparently like a big storm and UPS got like backed up and the merch isn't going to be here till Tuesday. So I... I'm still rocking my old school sailor hoodie, you know. I, I love this thing, but um, merch will be here next week. But, but as we were just going to celebrate, like, everything that God is doing in this church, I, I wanted to start a series called Breakthrough. And it's not some, like, fluffy, like, oh, like, believe in Jesus, he's going to give you a new car type of sermon. No, I, I really believe that God, there wants to be a, God wants a breakthrough in your life, a breakthrough of his presence. I believe he wants a breakthrough in uh, your family. I believe that he wants a breakthrough in this church. I believe it's a lot closer than you think. I believe that because of Hosea chapter six, uh, we actually read this in our last series. We just came out from a series called God is Love, where we talked all about the love of Jesus. It was an awesome series. If you want to check that out, you can check it out on our YouTube. If you, if you weren't here, it, it was probably one of my favorite series that we've done. Um, but in the midst of that series, we, we read this verse. It's Hosea ch uh, chapter 6, verse 3, and, and it's going to be a staple for this series. It says this. It says, let us know, let us press on, to know the Lord. His going out is as sure as dawn. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. Listen, that's a promise of God. This isn't like a, like a fluffy sermon. That is the word of God. God says, if you press into me, if you press on into me, if you get to know me, I promise you that I will come to you. My coming is as sure as the sunrise. How many of you woke up this morning and you thought, you know what? I don't know if the sun will be in rotation today. Anybody think that? Now, you may have thought, I don't know if I'll see the sun today. But you not seeing the sun has not made you doubt it, right? You still know it's there. Why is it sometimes when we're not seeing God, it makes us doubt him? The rotation of God has not stopped. I promise you, his coming is as sure as the dawn. And so I want to start a series today called Breakthrough. And I was going to start this series by talking about, man, I believe that we're on at Sailor Church on the edge of a breakthrough. I'm so excited about what God, I just got away and I prayed for a week. We just ended. How many of you are grateful you were taking part of the 40 days of fasting and prayer and you're grateful to eat again? Praise Jesus that we can eat again. I have not eaten solid food in 40 days and I will tell you that I have got like a whole list of things that I'm going to be eating this week and it is none of it's healthy it's going to be an incredible week of eating for me I'm so grateful but to end the fast me and me and my wife Allison we got away for a week and uh, we were staying in this in this house and it was just a prayer focused week and as I was praying, I'm just so excited about things that God was laying on our heart for, for the end of this year and for next year. And I was really praying and I really felt strongly that God is just about to do something in Salem Church. But he kind of brought me back this week and I really feel stirred up to talk a breakthrough in your own personal life. 
Because if you don't have a breakthrough in your personal life, if you don't experience God in your personal life, it's not going to do the church much good, right? Because I don't believe that one person runs this church. I believe that we are a body. The church is the body of believers. And so for the church to be, if for Sailor Church to be what Sailor Church is called to be, you have to be living in your calling. You have to be living in who you were called to be. And so today we're really going to press in on you need a breakthrough of God in your life. I don't know if you've ever tried to serve the Lord. I don't know if you've ever tried to serve the church. But if you try to serve the church without having the Lord inside of you, it's the most empty feeling in the world. They end up calling that burnout. Because people just start working and working. And then our identity becomes in what we're doing for the church rather than who we're doing it for. And all of a sudden we're empty. And man, I don't want that for you. We try to protect people from burnout here. And what's going to protect you from burnout is if you just have a breakthrough for the Lord. And that's what we want this morning. We want you to experience God in a powerful way. And so if you're like a note taker, you can title today's message, I did not ask for this. What happens when a breakthrough isn't what you expected? I'm going to have a twist in this one. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 4. This whole series is going to be over the next few chapters of 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 4. Uh, We're going to start in verse 8. And we may work our way all the way down to verse 37. We're feeling like super spiritual coming off this fast. So need a lot of the word of God this morning. Are you guys ready for the word of God? Second Kings chapter 4 verse 8. One day Elisha went on to Shunem where a wealthy woman lived who urged him to eat some food. So whenever he passed that way, he would turn in there to eat food. And she said to her husband, Behold, now I know that this is a holy man of God who is continually passing our way. Let us make a small room on the roof with walls and put there for him a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp so that whenever he comes to us, he can go in there. Now, I love this story right here. This is one of my favorite stories in the entire Bible. I'm going to have to preach fast, though, because I got way too much content and way too little time. I want to get you guys out to the bounce house and coffee that we have. So I'm going to start preaching fast, if you don't mind. Uh, I love this story because here you have this woman from Shunem, and the prophet Elisha is coming back and forth from her house. Now, I really want to point out something that, that's harder for us to comprehend uh, because we have, like, We've seen a lot of men of God do some crazy stuff. Let's just call it how it is. Men of God do some crazy stuff sometimes. You know, I won't even get into that. But in their day and age, the, the prophet of the Lord was like God himself almost. Now, I'm not, saying, I'm not saying Elisha was God, but Elisha was God to the people. Does that make sense, the, the difference there? He wasn't, I'm not saying he was God, but he was the voice of God to the people. So when Elisha, I mean, people would try to touch Elisha. Elisha, his bones hit someone, or someone, a dead man was thrown on his bones, and that man came back to life. I mean, that's the, the, the Holy Spirit that was living inside of Elisha. So Elisha, when people saw Elisha, he was the representative of God to, to, to all people. Now, there is a sermon in there that that's what we're called to be, but, but Elisha on a whole new level, because there weren't a lot of prophets, especially at this time in Israel, there were not a lot of prophets that were considered the Lord's, and so Elisha is like the guy. And so this woman from Shunem, she sees Elisha, and she recognizes all that God is doing in his life and all that is happening, and here is what she's not doing. Okay, the the woman of Shunem, she doesn't sit there and go, you know what? That's really great what uh, God is doing in Elisha's life. I'm just going to sit back and I'm going to do nothing. She doesn't sit back and she doesn't say, you know what? That's unfair what God is doing in Elisha's life. Why doesn't God do something like that in my life? She doesn't sit back and say, you know what, God? I'll do something for you if you do in my life what I see. Like if Elisha blesses me, if Elisha does something for me, I'm going to do something for you, Lord. That's not what she does. What she does is she goes and does action, right? She doesn't sit back. She what? She presses on to the Lord. That's the whole sermon series is pressing on to the Lord because when we press in, we will experience God in a new way. She doesn't sit back. She presses in. And maybe some of you, you're not seeing a breakthrough in your life because you're so busy asking God for something that you're not doing anything. 
I, I, I want to be careful here because I believe in asking God for Ask God, man, you pray for whatever you want. I, I, you know, be, be, well, be careful there, but, but you pray, pray, ask God. But some of you, you're, you're asking God where he's at and God is asking where you're at. Like you're asking God to move, but you've not moved at all. Look at what this woman does, though. She goes on a roof. It's like, it's like she sees the man of God. He leaves. She goes up on a roof and she's like, she calls her husband. She's like, Simon, get over here. I need, I need you to start building a room on my roof. Now, we could talk about like the marriage aspect there and, and all that stuff, but we'll save that for February. This woman literally turns her one story house into a two story house for the man of God. Think about that effort. She takes a one-story house and makes it a two-story house. Now, come on. It's easy to say, God, I need a breakthrough in my life. It's a lot harder to make space for a breakthrough to happen in your life, right? It's easy to say, God, I need you to reach my family. It's a lot harder to be a light to your family. It's easy to say, hey, God, change my wife. It's a lot harder to be a man your wife wants to be with. Wives, that, say, say, that, that works vice versa, too. See, praying is easy. Action is hard. But I'll promise you this, breakthrough is preceded by action. I promise you this. The, the, Jesus says to his disciples, he says that, that the kingdom of God is taken by violent men with force. There, there is an action. I'm not saying you have to earn it. I'm not saying you have to earn a breakthrough. But, but you're not going to see a breakthrough if you're lazy. The Bible says it this way. It says James chapter 2 verse 26 says faith apart from works is what is dead now i always heard this preached about salvation but in context it's really talking about just having faith now sure that can be faith in jesus but it's talking about faith just faith for god to move see some of you you say that you have faith in jesus but you're not moving like you have faith for, in jesus if you're having faith for a breakthrough, but you're unwilling to work for a breakthrough, that breakthrough, it's dead, right? If you say that you believe in God something, but all you did is ask for it, did you really have faith for it? Right? Like, think about it. If, if you ask for it, but you're not willing to prepare for, for what you asked for, do you believe that it's going to happen? If you ask God to move, but then you don't prepare for him to move, do you believe he's going to move? Right? If you ask for it, but you won't work for it, God will never bring it because you don't have real faith. You have, you have like lip faith. Some of you want a two-story home, but you only have one-story faith. You want to see God move like he's about to move in the Shunammite woman's life, but you're unwilling to go by the two-by-fours and the nails that's required so that you can build on top of your house. Look, the Shunammite woman, this is what I love. You do not see the Shunammite woman call God, Right? The Shunammite woman's not like, hey, God, I need you to build my house. That's not what she says. The Shunammite woman, she calls Chip and Joanna Gaines, and she's like, how do we start building on top of the house? Because I want to move God into my house. How crazy is it that Elisha is coming to her house and she asks him for nothing? Remember, Elisha's the voice of God, right? I think that if God showed up at our house, we'd be like, man, thank God. I need you, Lord. I need you to move in my life. Here's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for you to move in my family. Here's what I'm looking for in a man. Here's my list of like do's and don'ts. I hear here's what I'm looking for in a job. But the Shunammite woman, she never asks for anything. Instead, she says, what can I do for you, God? I, I know I'm getting tense. It's only going to get worse, though. I want to ask you, is your position more God, what can you do for me or God, what can I do for you? I'm not saying don't ask God for things. I want to be really careful there. I want to really press on you that, that I believe in praying. I, I have a big prayer list. I, I pray and I circle things down. I get on the floor and I intercede for things to happen in my life. That's not what I'm saying. But I think we have a lot of messages about praying God for things. Man, I want to bless the Lord. I, 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 I want to, the Bible says that we can bless God. I'm not saying don't ask him for things, but let me ask, is God, do you ever ask God what you can do for him? Or is he just like a magic lamp for, to you? Listen to me. God is not Robin Williams. And he is certainly not Will Smith. But some of you, you have tried to, I'm going to speak to you through Disney and you're not even going to see it. I, some of you are trying to cram God in a lamp. 
And in the words of Aladdin, he has all the power of the universe in itty bitty living space. Come on, that'll preach. Don't tell me that you can't find God in everything. Look, I, I get it. Disney's been in the, the hot seat recently with the church. Whatever, like this will preach. God, that's how God looks like in some of your lives. He has all the power of the universe, but he has no space to move in your life. Because maybe you're so caught up in what you want, you've never stopped to ask, God, what do you want? What does God want from me? You may be so desperate for a move of God in your life, but you haven't made room for him to move in your life. And I prom but I promise you this, if you make room, God will fill what you make. If you make room, God will fill it. Because Elisha, he doesn't sit back here and be like, you know what, this is really nice, thank you for the room, but I'm going to go to the Airbnb down the road. That's not what he does, right? What, what is he? he? He begins to fill what the Shunammite made. I imagine that like, uh, like he leaves, he comes back, the Shunammite woman's all excited, she just built the roof, she like closes his eyes and she's like, yo, come up, I got something to show you, like surprise, you know, this is so exciting. And, and, and I just imagine that Elisha looks at this woman's hospitality and generosity like, man, I, I didn't ask for this. Right, have you ever, there's something powerful when someone doesn't ask for it, right? Like, have you ever had someone do something nice for you that you didn't even ask for? We have a serve team leader here. Her name's Allie Lackey. And uh, Allie is like the greatest gift giver of all time. She was one of the founding members of Sela Church. Um, and she has like consistently uh, amazed me with her like gift giving ability. And there was one time in particular on my birthday that she combined like my three favorite things in life, reading leather and Jesus. Um, and she made me like this leather bookmark with my, like my life verse on it. I, I was amazed, right? I was, I was even like a little bit emotional and, and why? Because I didn't, I would have never asked for it. I, I hate talking about my birthday. I hate when like everybody like tries to make it all sappy and weird. And it's just not my thing. Birthdays are not my thing. Uh, but, but I, so I didn't ask for it, but I got emotional because she like knew me and she did it because she loved me, right? Listen, do you ever try to bless God or do you just try to obey God? Now, obedience is obviously important, but, but do you try to bring God more than just simple obedience? Like when was the last time you looked at God and you brought him a sacrifice that he didn't ask for? Married women will get this. Men, listen for a second. It means more when she doesn't ask for it. It does. Like, like, have you, when was the last time you brought your wife Starbucks that she didn't ask you to pick up on the way home? Or when was the last time you brought her flowers that wasn't an apology? Or Valentine's Day, that doesn't count. Like, like it means more when she doesn't ask for it, right? Does God have to ask you for everything you do? Like, if God wants you to move, does he have to send you a text message or write on your bedroom wall? Or, or do you just think, man, how can I bless the Lord today? You can be a blessing to God. Elisha didn't ask for it, but she did it anyway. And the man of God, listen, what God does. God always blesses those who bless him. Look at verse 11. It says, one day he came there and he turned into the chamber and rested there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, call this Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him and he said to him, say now to her, see, you have done all of this trouble. You've gone to all of this trouble for us. What is to be done for you? Would you have a word spoken on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? She answered, I dwell among my own people. Now, I want to point out something. God has not done anything in this woman's life yet, but she is still content where she's at. I can't stress the importance of this enough. The most satisfied, the most fulfilled people on life are not the ones that are always like, God, I need this, God, I need this, God, I need this. They're the people that are content where God has them. Like, like you can be content where God has you. This woman, she's not looking for anything. She's content where she's at. So what she does is she actually supports the man of God rather than suffocating him. Listen, you don't have to wait for God to move to be grateful. I'm not telling you that what you're praying for is unimportant. I'm not telling you that you may not have like actual needs. I'm telling you that if you can't find joy where you're at, it's not real joy because joy is based off the spirit, not your position. You can have the Holy Spirit wherever you are. You can have the Holy Spirit in the darkest pit. You can have him in the palace. But listen, if, if, if you don't find the Holy Spirit where you are, how do you think you're going to like carry him where you're going? 
Listen, stop waiting for someone else or for a circumstance to change for you to find joy, for you to find happiness, for you to find contentment. Because here's the thing, this woman, she didn't have everything. It's easy to look at this story and be like, man, it must be nice. This woman had money. She had a husband. She had everything I don't have. This woman wanted kids, but she couldn't. We don't see why she was barren, but we're going to see in a moment that she had desired kids, but for whatever reason, she wasn't able to have them. So, so don't tell me that her situation, there were things that she wanted, but you can still find contentment in a barren season. And it really is hard. If you can't find God in a barren season, listen, it's really hard to find him in a fruitful season. Because in the fruitful season, there's more distraction. In the barren season, it's just you and the Lord. So if you can't find him in what's barren, how can you carry a plan to carry him in what's fruitful? God can't trust us with more when we're satisfied with little. In fact, I want you to think about something. The room that this woman built on top of the house was probably always in the plan. If you're a creative in here, or even if you're not, everybody's creative. You were built in the image of God. God is creative. You're creative. If you're like me, that's not in the form of art. You, I, I, if you ever see me try to draw anything, I can make stick figures look bad. Um, but, but everybody has some form of creative. It comes out in various ways, but we're all creative. Anyway, it's a side sermon. Um, sometimes your best ideas... My best ideas in the world, my best sermon ideas, my best ideas for the church, my best whatever, they always come from something that's been brewing in me for a long time. They come from something personal. They come from something that, that God has been developing, not just, you know, it's not just something that you discover, right? I very rarely discover ideas. Ideas are almost always developed. And so this woman, she has this amazing idea. She's like, let's build a room on top, of my roo on top of the roof for this man. This woman, I imagine she was always wanting to build a third room or a second room or whatever, a room on top of her house. She was always going to, she always wanted more space. But the space that she wanted originally would have been for a nursery, Right? She wanted kids. She was always going to have to expand. In Jewish culture, whenever your kids got old enough, you had to build upon your house. In Jewish culture, you didn't like grow up to move out. You grow, to, you grow up and then you move in. Like You expanded your family. Now, for some of our students in here, that sounds horrifying, but, but like your biggest blessing was to carry on your family's lineage. So she was expecting to build onto the house, but she was expecting to build on the house for her son but, or, or for her children child, but then she was never able to have one. And then God shows up at her door. And I think a lot of times when God shows up at the door in the midst of disappointment, we turn him away, right? Like, God, I'm too hurt. God, I'm too disappointed. God, I was expecting you to give me a child. But instead of turning away the man of God, she fills the room with him. How incredible. She takes what was hopeless and she filled it with the hope of God. She says, I may not have the wood to build a nursery, but I have the wood to build a place for the Lord. Look at me. Do not let emptiness deprive you of hope. Instead, fill what was empty with the hope of God. And, and God never disappoints. Never. He says in verse 14, what then is to be done for her? Gehazi answered, well, she has no son and her husband is old. He was like stalking this couple. He said, he's old. They're not having kids. And so Elisha said, call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the doorway and he said, at this season, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. She said, no, my Lord, old man of God, do not lie to your servant. But the woman conceived, and she bore a son about that time the following spring, as Elisha had said to her. Listen, because she filled what should have been a nursery with the hope of God, God fills her nursery with a child. When you put your hope in the Lord, listen, I promise that there is a breakthrough on the other side of it. And it may not be the blessing you're expecting, right? The woman was not expecting this. She like did like the Bible version of don't play with me. Right? She said, don't play with me, Elisha. I, I put to rest the desire for a child. Some, sometimes, let me, side sermon again. 
Sometimes you have to put to rest your desire for something before God will bless you with it. It has to stop being an idol before he can trust you with it. Because sometimes the thing we're asking for God will kill us. But God fills this woman's nursery with a child. She wasn't expecting it. She didn't see it coming. She had learned to be content where she was at. And he blesses her anyway. He says, in one year time, you'll be holding a baby boy. But some of you, you built a room. You were faithful. You trusted the Lord. You saw him move. You experienced a breakthrough. But in the end, the breakthrough broke you. I've seen so many times where people are following God and it comes to a place where the breakthrough gets hard or where following God hurts. And maybe you're in here and you've been through something and it hurt and you don't know why God led you through what he did. That's, that's what happens in this story. This woman, she has this breakthrough with her son, but what turned out to be a breakthrough ends up breaking her. In verse 18, it says, when the child had grown, he went out one day to his, fa uh, to his father among the reapers. And he said to his father, oh, my head, my head. The father said to his serpent, carry, or servant, <laughs> wrong story. The father said to his servant, carry him to his mother. And when he had lifted him up, he brought him to his mother. The child sat on her lap till noon, and, there, and then he died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God. You can, you can highlight, circle that verse. We're not going to preach it yet, but we're going to get to it at the end. She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door behind him and went out. Then she called to her husband and said, Send me one, sir, uh, one of the servants and one of the donkeys that may go quickly to the man of God and come back again. And he said, Why will you go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. And she said, All is well. Then she saddled the donkey and she said to her servant, Urge the animal to go on. Do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. And when the man of God saw her coming, he said to Gehazi, his servant, Look, there is the Shunammite. Run at once to meet her and say to her, Is all well with you? Is all well with your husband? Is all well with the child? And she answered, All is well. And when she came to the mountain of the man of God, she caught hold of his feet. And Gehazi came to push her away, but the man of God said, Leave her alone, for she is in bitter distress, and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. Then she said, Did I ask my Lord for a son? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? The son God gave dies. She was promised that this time next year you would be holding a baby boy. And now she's holding the lifeless body of her boy. And if I'm her, I'm thinking, God, if you knew I was going to be holding my baby boy in my arms alive, why would you not tell me that I would be holding him dead? So she goes to the man of God and she throws herself at his feet. I mean, she, she, this is not like some like, this isn't like Mary washing the feet of Jesus, right? This isn't like some like tender feet moment. This is, this woman, this is like wrestling with Jacob moment. She like grabs his feet to the point the servant's trying to like get her off. She like freaked Gehazi out. Gehazi's like, crazy woman, get off my master. And, and Elisha's like, like, do not, this is intense. This is, she's not just coming, like she is being real with Elisha. She is upset. She's saying, did I not say, do not tease me, Elijah? Right? Like, did I not say, don't play games with me? I did not ask for this. Some of you are in a place right now where you're looking at God and you're saying, I did not ask for this, God. I did not ask for this death. I did not ask for this suffering. And you're sitting in this room and you're saying, this is not what I asked for. Right? Like, like Parker, you told me earlier in the sermon that God does not disappoint. Well, he has disappointed me. The word I have for you, it's not a fun word, 
I experienced this word earlier this year. I, I, I was in a season earlier this year. And I said, God, you gave me a blessing and it broke me. And the word that God gave for me it's two years in a row, he said, wait. I know that's not fun to hear, but your story, it's not over. Wait on the Lord. The story of the Shunammite woman, it was not over. And I promise you that your story is not over either. If you run from the Lord like so many people do, so many people experience the death and they run from the Lord and they end up being lifeless and far away from the Lord. But I promise you this, that with the Lord, you can find life even in the midst of death, even in the midst of what looks dead, you can find in life and so the key it is not to run away from the Lord but to come to his feet and look here's the secret you can be angry at the feet of Jesus I there's nowhere in the Bible that it says hey come to the Lord and fake your prayers because you're upset there's nowhere in the Bible that says hey come to Jesus and be like, like, be like prim and proper now there are verses in the Lord that says hey come to the Lord with fear and trembling I'm all about that but I see so many times in Scripture, you know who God honors? God honors the people that come to him and is like, God, I do not understand. They, he honors the Job that comes and says, God. Job looks at God and says, God, you're not even just. Right? And yet God tells Job's friends that Job did not sin in everything he said. See, God is not scared of your anger. He knows it's there. Bring it to him. Come to his feet. Some of us take our anger and we're like, forget you, God. I take my anger and I go to God. I grab his feet and I say, Lord, you're going to have to answer me because I don't understand. If you knew that my baby boy, if you knew that I was going to hold him alive, why am I now holding him dead? Wait. Wait on the Lord because your story is not over. If you position yourself to live in the death of whatever your son is, then you will live in death. But the woman comes to the feet and she discovers life. Be real and be desperate. That's how I'll say it. Be desperate for God to move in your life, but be real with him where you're hurting. Because listen, God's heart, Elisha's heart here, it wasn't for the woman to experience this death. In fact, what does he do? He, he, he listens and then he goes. He says in verse 29, he says, tie up your, he said to Gehazi, tie up your garments, garment and take my staff in your hand and go. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. And if anyone greets you, do not reply and lay my staff on the face of the child. Then the mother of the child said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So he arose and followed her. Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was no so sound or sign of life. Therefore, he returned to him and said, the child has not awakened. When Elisha came into the house, he saw the child lying dead on his bed. So he went in and shut the door behind the two of them, and he prayed to the Lord. Then he went up and lay hands on the child, putting his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, his hands on his hands, and he stretched himself out upon him. The flesh of the child became warm. Then he got up, walked once back and forth in the house and went up and stretched himself out on him again. The child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. Then he summoned Gehazi and said, call this Shunammite. So he called her and when she came into him, he said, pick up your son. She came and fell at his feet, bowing to the ground. Then she picked up her son and went out. I didn't touch on this earlier well, I told you to circle it and highlight it, but where did the woman place the body of her son? In the room that she built for the Lord. She puts the death of her hope back in the place where her hope was born. The same room that birthed the miracle brings life back into the miracle. And some of you, like you've been running, but your answer is to go back into the room where God first met you or where God spoke to you. You need to put what seems dead in your life back in the place where it first came to life, where God first gave you, gave you hope. See, what happens too often is we don't go to God when something dies. Because the blessing that God gave becomes more important than the blesser. The room of hope turns into just a nursery. Because we were hoping for a child and when we got one, it was like, okay, 
this is what's important here now. So when the child dies, the hope dies. But the Shunammite white woman, she doesn't miss a beat. She immediately puts what was dead on the bed of the room and she goes back to the man of God. Some of you need to stop planning. Some of you need to stop like being like, man, how do I recover from this? And you need to start taking what looks dead in your life and placing it before the Lord and saying, God, what are you going to do about this? And I'm not saying that whatever it is, that it'll be just like this story that will come back to life. But I promise you that he will bring hope back to you. How, how do I know that? How, how do I know? Because the, the simple answer is this, is the same God that brings this boy to life is the God that gave up the life of his son. Right? What does Elisha do? Elisha does this really weird, intimate thing with this kid, right? He, 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 he looks at the boy and, and he takes, he, 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 he lays down stretches himself out puts his face sorry tech team I know I'm not even like the mic he puts his face upon the boy and when the boy sneezes it, it, like, like a sneeze is a sign of life right it's a sign of breath what was breathless all of a sudden had breath but it took a couple times right man of Elijah looked at the boy and he stretched himself out. I don't know why the boy was laying that way. But he stretched himself. 2,000 years later, probably 1,500 years later, there was a man that stretched himself out. Arms wide, blood draining so that he could breathe breath into you again. And if I can trust him to breathe breath into me, I can trust him to breathe breath into my situation. I can trust him to bring hope into my life. If I can trust him with my salvation, I can trust him with my situation. And it may hurt, it may be hard, it may be trouble. It may look like the breakthrough is broken. But I promise you that the same God that broke through on the day that his son died, he broke the temple so that the spirit could be free. The spirit is still free today. The spirit can breathe life into your situation. The spirit can breathe life into you no matter your circumstance. God stretched himself upon the cross for you so that you could have life. Jesus says in John 10, 10, he says, I came that you could have life and life abundantly. What death has caused you to doubt that promise? The death was the enemy. He says the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So the death in your life, it was not God. It was the enemy. I, I may have not asked for the brokenness, but I didn't ask for the brokenness of my Savior either. I didn't know that I needed Jesus to be broken on the cross for me. I didn't ask for that. I didn't ask for the blood of Jesus. And yet Jesus gave it anyway. It was a gift that was given, but not asked for. And at this moment, when we really grasp who God is, I want to respond like the woman in verse 37. It says that she came and she fell at his feet, bowing to the ground. Then she picked up her son and she went out. The woman started at the feet of Elisha and she ended at the feet of Elisha. What I want to do this morning, I, I want us to posture ourselves back at the feet of Jesus. Maybe some of you, it needs to be an aggressive foothold. Maybe you need to come and it's like, grab onto the feet and be like, God, I need you to answer me. Maybe some of you, it needs to be that Mary, like washing the feet, just remind yourself, man, Jesus, I love you. I rededicate myself to you this morning. Maybe some of you just need to, to remember that in the midst of life like your life's just been busy maybe you just need to refocus on the feet of Jesus but I promise you that your breakthrough happens in the midst of where you're postured and your posture needs to be at the feet of Jesus so I just want to read Hosea chapter 6 over you I want to I want to this is the word of God the word of God is living it is active it is not dead amen so I just want to read this scripture over you I want to prophesy this over you so would you close your eyes would you bow with me I want you to receive this. 
I don't care what the world has told you. If you press on to know the Lord, he will come. I don't care what you have told yourself. I don't care what you did that makes you feel like you are the only person in this room that's unworthy of Jesus. If you press on to the Lord, his coming is as sure as the dawn. I don't know who told you that you were unworthy or who left you and made you feel like everyone would leave you. But God coming to you is as sure as the springs that rain the earth. Hosea chapter six, verse three. Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord because his going out is as sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. Jesus, we ask you to come this morning. We ask for a breakthrough in our lives. We ask for a breakthrough in this church. We ask for a breakthrough in our families, God. Jesus, we are desperate for you, God. There are some real things that feel dead in this room, God. I pray that you begin to breathe life into us because when we're full of the life of Jesus, we can begin to bring life all around us. We're called to be Elisha. We're called to be the ones that bring life into what looks like death. But God, we can only do that if we're experiencing the breakthrough ourselves. So God, I pray this morning before we go next week talking about what you want to do in the church, I ask that we receive your reign this morning. We open ourselves up to your breakthrough, to your reign, God. We open ourselves up to the Spirit of God. We're desperate for a move of you. We want your presence, God. We want your Spirit in our lives again. Some of us need to come to your feet to get that this morning. Some of us need to reposture ourselves. Someone in this room for the first time, you need to surrender to Jesus. You need to give your life to him because you've been told your whole life he is not good, but this morning you've experienced something swelling up inside of you and you don't know, but it is good. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. God, we're looking to you for a breakthrough this morning. You and you alone. In your name we pray, amen.